Hello and welcome back to History's Tech and today we are looking at the infantry fighting vehicle. Now, I've already talked about the Armored Personnel Carrier, which is basically a transportation vehicle designed for self-defense purposes to move troops and equipment. The IFV, on the other hand, while still designed to carry troops into battle, is a direct fire support vehicle, meaning it is designed to go into combat and directly engage other vehicles and combatants. And as defined by the 1990 Treaty on Conventional Armed Forces in Europe, it is an armored combat vehicle which is designed and equipped primarily to transport a combat infantry squad which is armed with an integral or organic cannon of at least 20 millimeter caliber and sometimes an anti-tank missile launcher. With that definition, let's go ahead and see what gave birth to the IFV, the Infantry Fighting Vehicle. Now, as I talked about previously, the APC, the Armored Personnel Carrier, actually existed since World War I. However, it was really World War II that we're going to see the growth and development of the APC. Now, as we get into the Cold War, we're really going to see the APC flourish. This is where the M113, developed by the United States, is going to come into play, which is the most built APC in the world. And we're going to see nations around the world deploy these. It's going to be very popular with not only NATO countries, but Warsaw Pact nations as well, as each of these groups develop their own APCs. But you have to remember, this vehicle is strictly a transportation vehicle. It is only armed to defend itself. And this is all going to change because of East and West Germany. Now, because of the heavy tension that's going to occur between West and East Germany, we're going to actually see West Germany start to develop its own weapons and equipment independently from other NATO nations. And this is honestly due to the fact that this is where the highest level of tension, the closest to the action, is really going to occur in Europe at the time. Now, the West German army is actually going to develop a new battle doctrine to support themselves. And in this, they decide that the APC needs to be much more heavily armed as a support vehicle to tank units. And the idea is that this vehicle will not only carry troops in the battle, but it will engage light armor, light structures, and have an anti-tank role so that tanks can fight in tank-to-tank -tank warfare and not have to worry about other types of vehicles. And the Germans develop what's known as the Schutzenpanzer Lang SH-30, also known as the SPZ-12-3. This meant that the former APC could now become a frontline vehicle, thus creating the IFV, the Infantry Fighting Vehicle. It didn't take long for other European nations to follow, both the French and the Austrians will develop their own IFVs, and while they are very similar, they actually added a new feature to this, which was portholes on the sides of the vehicle that could allow the troops inside to shoot out, thus meaning they didn't even have to leave in order to provide extra fire support to the IFV. And other European nations are going to follow, such as the Swedish... The Dutch and the Belgians are all going to begin experimenting with their own IFVs. Now, while this is all going on, the Soviet Union is actually going to be spending a lot of time on its own APCs, the BTR series, the BTR-50, the BTR-152. However, with the rising tension that's occurring during the Cold War, the Soviet Union decides they need a vehicle that can actually be sent into an area that had weapons of mass destruction used on it and be able to not only protect its troops, but actually be a combat vehicle as well. So the Soviet Union develops its own infantry fighting vehicle, the BMP series. This vehicle met all the needs for the Soviet Union at the time. It had a 73 millimeter smoothbore cannon. It had a anti-missile capabilities on it. It had enough armor to resist 50 caliber machine guns and had firing ports to allow the troops inside to provide additional support for the vehicle. It had combined the duties of a light tank with an APC and it did such a good job that the Soviet Union kept improving it, developing the BMP-2 and the BMP-3 in the process. Now not to be left out of the IFV game, the United States saw the Need to replace its M113 and M114s, which, while reliable, didn't provide the fire support that would be needed in future combat. And so they actually came up with what was known as the MICV 65 program, which was to replace the M113 and M114 and any other APCs with an APC capable of direct fire support. Several vehicles were developed during this project, including this one here. Known as the XM-765, it also was known as the Armored Infantry Fighting Vehicle. And while the United States ended up not adopting this design, it was actually purchased by the Dutch and would become their YPR-765. Now, while the United States ended up completely abandoning this project, what they learned from it and what they liked from it ended up being used to develop this, the M2 Bradley. 
Now, the M2 wasn't a great vehicle when it first came along. The United States had to let make a lot of improvements and upgrades to this IFE, but we ended up creating the Bradley Fighting Vehicle out of this, which now has created a whole family of vehicles. And towards the end of the Cold War, we're going to see more and more IFVs being developed. One very important one is going to be the South African Rattel IFV. This ends up being the first IFV produced that is wheel-based, not track-based. And more importantly, it is specifically designed as an anti-mine vehicle, something that's going to become extremely important when we get into the 21st century. We're going to continuously keep seeing more and more nations develop and upgrade the IFV as we get into the 1980s and into the 1990s. The German Martyr will replace the HS-30, and it's eventually going to be replaced by the Puma as the main IFV for the German military. The British are going to adopt the Warrior, which is interesting because they're going to become one of the last major countries to adopt an IFV, as at the time, they really didn't see the purpose of it or the importance of having an IFV up until basically the late 80s. And that's going to lead us into modern day, where since the 90s, we're going to see the IFV placed in every major conflict. We're going to see it in the Gulf Wars, the invasion of Iraq and Afghanistan. We're going to see it in places like the Soviet-Afghan War of the 80s, the Russo-Georgian Wars, the Russo-Ukrainian Wars. And its popularity is not waning in any way, shape, or form. We're looking at the next generation of IFVs being developed by multiple countries right now. But there you have it, a quick look at the IFV, a vehicle that evolved from the APC and took on a role of its own and now is a mainstream, mainline vehicle of militaries around the world. Now, I do have one more armored personnel carrier vehicle I'm going to do. I'm going to do amphibious armored personnel carriers, and then I will move on from there. I've got a whole lot more coming up. So that's it for today. I thank you for joining me, and I look forward to talking to you on the next time.